like to thank everyone for being here today uh, and taking part in this panel. Uh, in this panel, we have uh, three papers, two uh, on method of organizing space in architecture and uh, one on the possibility that robotic technologies bring to architecture and to the construction sector. Uh, the discussion will take place at the end of the three papers. So the fifth paper uh, is presented by Giacomo Palla and his title is uh, Ray, Nine Square Grid Fragmented Parts and uh, Unified Wall. Uh, it is a work developed in uh, the context of a PhD and the juxtaposition of the nine square grid and fragmentation in a kind of coherent whole Combining the grid and fragmentation methods, uh, the work tried to reconcile the need for an internal formal logic and fragmentation as a form or formal complexity. Okay? <laughs> Giacomo Paola comes from the University of Innsbruck, Institute of Urban Design, and he is a PhD candidate studying under the guidance of Peter Trammer. He is conducting a research about formalism and uh, its uh, relation to narrative and time paracrosnism. Paracrosni. Yeah. Okay. Uh, using as a departure point Piranesi's work. Okay, please, John. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for selecting my paper, of course, and to give me the opportunity to, let's say, present some work I've been doing for my PhD, even though this is really the early stage, I wouldn't even call it as a project or anything, it's more or less a series of drawing I've been made. Uh, but before starting, I would really like to, uh, let's say, say something in order to avoid any possible, uh, um, let's say, misunderstanding in the sense that uh, where, what I'm working on as a formal method, it's more related to the notion of let's say, composition in architecture, so in a more, let's say, classical way, if you want, even though maybe through some digital tools, but that's not even important uh, by now, which is to say that uh, uh, what I'm working on with Peter Trumer and others is that, let's say, the idea that architecture is something that is way beyond a problem related to performance and optimization and those kind of things, which is, at the end of the day, the problem of the parts to whole relationship that somehow frames, uh, if we want, all the history of architecture. In this sense, uh, I've changed a bit the, the presentation uh, in um, relation to the paper, because recently, uh, a few days ago, last week, Mario Carpo published this um, paper uh, in which he's uh, discussing and criticizing um, the idea of the post-digital architecture, as he calls it, uh, that is to say, the comeback on, of in fashion of the postmodern and collage and also or to say. What is criticizing is the idea that these kind of uh, new tendencies that are really fashionable, according to him, are not producing a novelty. And in this sense, I would like to somehow challenge, ideally and immodestly, Carpo, in the sense that his idea somehow presupposes uh, a general understanding of the discipline of architecture as a linear evolution that goes, let's say, talking about modernity from Alberti up to today, in which each architect through generation, every new generation of architects is inventing new formal methods in order to implement the discourse of architecture and invent new forms. Uh, now, the problem, I, I think, in Carpo's argument is that somehow uh, this way of thinking about architecture is not really explaining uh, what's going on today. This is a series of screenshots I took on Instagram one evening. And as we see, it's really like a total mess. Uh, but it, why is it a total mess? Because somehow every one of us today is really worried about doing something new, doing something that is novel, uh, and produce this novelty that is based on, on new formal methods that uh, I would like here to just try to individuate some formal, uh, some historical determination of this discourse. Uh, because I, I believe that somehow this way of thinking goes back to the late 17th century and 18th century, when architects, particularly in France, like uh, Claude Perrault, which is the drawing on the 
right? Uh, starts to think about the orders of architecture, in this case, as a composition of modules. While before, there, it was a more, let's say, not mystical, but less methodological way of thinking the composition. For instance, on the left, there is a jo um, drawing by Giorgio de, Mar uh, de Martini, who is uh, using the anthropocentric way of thinking about architecture as a matter of proportionality. So basically, uh, in, those, in that period, somehow architects started to rethink architecture as a matter of composition of parts that are defined through methodologies, through techniques, and through specific methods. Uh, of course, which is basically, uh, since then probably, or before, but since then more explicitly, uh, the question of the formal method in the terms of, in the context of composition has always been the uh, opposition between these two notions that are simplicity and complexity. Uh, if we start, let's say, with simplicity, uh, we have an architect like Durand, who in the, the 19th century is somehow is the first one who exp uh, is the one who most ex more explicitly than any anyone else uh, starts to work on the idea of architecture as a composition of parts, in which the overall whole is composed by these elements that come together through the formalization of grids, in which uh, th that serves as a kind of a diagram in order to re reconstruct the, the plan of architecture. And this is, for instance, one of his work, but he was also giving to his students, for instance, paper that were gridded, and students had to draw through these lines in order to make architecture. So there was this idea of methodology that starts to be really pervasive in this notion of architecture, and particularly with the tool of the grid, which is, uh, here I quote Connie Rowe, because I believe somehow he's the one who most explicitly, more explicitly than anyone else, somehow defines the notion of the grid, because he defines it as a sort of a democratic formal system, in the sense that, of course, when you have all the parts that are equal to each other, you cannot uh, think about parts, uh, symmetries, that are more predominant, and so, according to him, it's also a way to somehow get in read by modernism of monumentality, even though probably uh, we could discuss that. Um, and, of course, there are many examples of this kind of conception. Hilbert Seimer is one of the most explicit, or we all know it, Le Corbusier in his city for three million starts to work on this idea of the grid uh, with these buildings that are all the same and reconstruct this, of course, modernist notion of uh, composition as a, an abstract diagram. Or more explicit than anyone else is Miss van der Rohe, who, uh, for instance, in this project for Boston, for the University of Boston, is doing, developing at first a master plan that is based on a grid. Then the buildings are developed on the basis of the same grid that it is, that it is separated. And even the elevation and all the details are situated inside this kind of a diagram and frame. Or more uh, explicitly and probably more radically, others in just drawings, uh, which is yeah, something that probably we should discuss, uh, are thinking about architecture as just as a composition, an abstract composition of automatic elements that goes together. This is made with a typing machine, for instance, and it is a sort of critique about the idea of composition looking for neutrality, which is uh, something that, uh, despite all the discussions about complexity and all of these things, is still going on somehow, is still topical in the sense there are a lot of architects who are working with these notions. Uh, for instance, Pierre Vittorio already, in a theoretical way, it's re uh, reconsidering all of the notion of neutrality and these kind of formal methods in order to think of arch architecture. And it's also developing projects that probably are a bit inhuman. Uh, this is done with Kerstin Gers uh, as a master plan, in which, again, the idea is basically to make drawings with uh, this notion of neutrality and simplicity as a compositional tool. On the other hand, uh, side of the spectrum, we have complexity that is a sort of a second history. And I think it's more interesting now, nowadays to focus on these topics rather than on a general discourse as Carpo and others do, in the sense that allow us to reconstruct new meanings, I think. Uh, 
which, for instance, while uh, in, the 17th in the 18th century in France, architects were looking for simplicity, others uh, like Piranesi were developing the idea of complexity in architecture. This is his archaeological, so-called archaeological reconstruction of the Campo Marzio in Rome. And him, for instance, is even arguing about the fact that uh, he writes, the human understanding is not so short and limited as to be unable to add new graces and embellishments to the works of architecture. What he's saying is that somehow architects are, have the right to change architecture, to, put, to invent new shapes, to use nature as a reference, to do whatever they want. Because after all, we are smarter than just the idea of using strict methodologies. Uh, and of course, the idea of complexity is somehow we can also read the idea of the digital architecture. This is, let's say, probably some of the latest uh, tendencies. As the idea of developing a notion of complexity, of course, in this case, is more uh, motivated from the sciences of chaos, complexity theory, and uh, computer engineering, and so on and so forth. Yet, uh, as it, there is a history of the no, for the notion of simplicity, so there is one for the notion of complexity uh, as a formal method. This is, for instance, John Sean, who made this project for the Bank of England as a sort of combination of parts uh, which reconstruct a sort of collage, even though there is a whole, an overall uh, composition in which all the parts are bending according to each other in order to reconstruct the overall plan. Or in the 20th century, of course, people like uh, Rietveld, in this case, or anyway, all the architects related to the, the steel movement, or uh, Le Corbusier is working with the notion of collage as a form of complexity, or even more explicitly, Peter Eisenman and others are, of course, uh, developing the idea of complexity as a formal method for composing architecture. <laughs> well, yeah, and others. Now, uh, I think that if, if the grid is uh, the main tool for the development of abstract simplicity, as I already argues, the grid can also seen, be seen as a, form, as a sort of figure, in the sense that uh, I think Rosalind Krauss uh, puts it pretty well in this paper, very famous paper about the grids, in which she describes two ways of looking at the grid. One is uh, the abstract one, uh, while the second is the idea of the grid as a mapping of, of the space inside a frame, which is to say a, the grid as a figure. So on the one hand, we have the idea of the, of the grid as an abstract diagram, while on the other, the, the idea of the grid as a formal figure. Of course, just by looking at this figure, it's quite obvious that uh, architects have worked with this notion. Uh, John Adak is probably the most explicit one with Peter Eisenman. I think, though, that John Adak is more refined because somehow it's not just an abstract composition, but it's also working on the notion of uh, domesticity, particularly in some of his drawings like this one that is the Texas House 7, uh, in which, as we see, he's really struggling uh, uh, with the need of, let's say, abstract composition as a figure with functional elements in the plan as a form of way of thinking about, about, about architecture. Of course, these architects were more interested in drawings rather than building, and I think rightly so. Uh, yes, so, of course, this is really basically where I started from, I mean, almost stupidly, uh, with the figure of the nine square grid. But then how to produce a complexification in the sense, is it possible nowadays getting rid of the digital, which is one of the interests somehow I'm sharing with my advisor, uh, to, I mean, getting rid of the, let's say, literal uh, idea of complexity as a natural embodiment by architecture. A way, is there a way to create, a, again, a form of complexification that takes to get, uh, brings together, uh, bridges together a uh, notion of, sim of simple composition and complex composition. So if we look at fragmentation, which is defined by Robin Evans uh, as the idea of having fragments uh, and pieces that come from a whole. So what he's arguing is that when we look at a composition that is made of fragments, we identify something as broken. So it means that we become detective of its history. So the broken parts come from a sort of whole and we can see the whole through these parts. Um, of course, 
We also know that there are other ways that like aggregation or nowadays it's called uh, discrete parts and this kind of debates about way of aggregating parts without a whole. But I think Robin Evans uh, describes this notion by using this metaphor that is the metaphor of the blind man who have to describe an elephant. And in this case, these blind men are asked to redraw and describe an elephant by touching it. And of course, each of the men can just reconstruct a part of it. And the, the overall composition of the elephant is, of course, incoherent, even though it reconstructs the elephant. And he used, uh, Evans uses this argument in order to describe the uh, cubist um, paintings. This is, I think, probably the most explicit in this sense. Or some architectural tendencies of the time uh, he writes in the late 80s. Uh, this is the project of the Forum des Halles in Paris. Or he also describes this project by Alvaro Siza, uh, which I won't say the name here in Portugal, uh, in which somehow, but interestingly enough, he's criticizing these projects in the sense that he's <coughs> arguing that uh, there is a literal uh, interpretation of the fragmentation. So we have the fragmentation, but this Id cubist idea is too literal. It's quite obvious, according to Evans. So now, what I did is really, really somehow even stupid, if you want, uh, which is I took the grid, and I just gave to the various parts some sort of rotations, uh, random, in this case, rotations through all the pieces are rotated according to a point, in this case, the central point and then a series of formal manipulation in, the, in order to uh, find a, to reconstruct a hole among these parts. In these cases, working on the angles and intersections between the parts. And then I overimposed, yes, this is the one, uh, the starting grid as a diagram. So in order to have the overimposition of the diagram and the figure all together, having these sorts of results, which again, those are really just drawings. It was the beginning of what I'm doing, which is a bit more complex and, and different. But anyway, this is, this is what I've done. Uh, as a form of, let's say, rethinking somehow the digital, which is not just about the, the production of novelties, but it has some sort of interest in the relation with architectural history in the sense that I deeply believe that today, to look just for novelties or optimizations or all of those sorts of things, it's really restrictive and it's not really producing anything particularly interesting by now. Uh, while I think that architecture should probably go and probably reinvent its history in a more critical way. And that's more or less it. Yeah. Sergio Mendes, and is titled Circumstances Generate the Form, Origin and Evolution of the Hospital Pavilion Typology. Um, this paper analyzes the evolution of the typology of the Hospital Pavilion in Paris after the fire in 1772 of the Hotel Dieu, and aims to demonstrate that this uh, Typology underwent several adaptations over time, depending on the context and the, the needs that prevail when it was used. The methodology is based on the analysis of variation in the form of typology, considering the relationship between the way the main circulation areas were organized and positioned uh, pavilions. Sergio Mendes is an assistant professor in construction and technologies within the master degree in architecture at ESA, uh, director of the laboratory of research in architecture and design at ESA, and develops scientific activity in the, the area of construction and technologies. Okay. Thank you very much. Please. So, good afternoon. Um, I'm very fun to be here this afternoon. This is a paper I wrote specifically for the symposium, and it's uh, kind of um, the end of a 
of um, investigation I have done in typology. So uh, I have joined some figures with some schemes I have drawn, and you should interpret the schemes as, I don't know what, this isn't working, sorry. <laughs> well. So uh, we will have uh, the black line will be the limits of the buildings. The continuous red line will be the main interior circulation zones. And the discontinuous red line will be the cover main exterior circulation zones. So in 1772, it burned the Hotel Dieu, which was the, the biggest uh, hospital in Paris, in medieval Paris. And this was an hospital where the mortality was rather elevated because they have a ratio of free patients for bed. And they didn't separate the, 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 the patients by diseases, which means that when they have contagious diseases, everybody got sick. So when it burned down, uh, several, uh, several personalities interested themselves in discussing what they should do about the construction of the building, if they should reconstruct it as it was, or if they should uh, construct it in another way. And the French, uh, there was a French commission created to study this kind of buildings. And um, they launched a public uh, architectural competition in 1777. And this is a project by Jean-Baptiste Leroy uh, in, in which he proposes uh, several pavilions uh, in a very systematized way. And, uh, is, um, and um, uh, what is very interesting is what Leroy wrote about this project. It is that he speaks about the pavilions as they were tents in a camp. And there should be, the idea is, was that it, there was a lot of uh, hair between the buildings that was very important for avoiding the, the contagious diseases between the patients. And so the, the French Commission was created. They visited several hospitals, namely in the UK. And this was one of the most important visits hospitals if they visit was the Royal Naval Hospital of Stonehouse, which was a project made by Alexander Rowhead, who was uh, uh, simultaneously an architect and a military. And somehow this layout has something to do with the tents in the, of the military in the, in the fields. Uh, they, are, uh, they are separated one from the others, providing the possibility of the troops to, to do this, their maneuvers. And so in 1788, uh, M. Tennant, which par, uh, was a part of that commission, he publicated this book, The Memoirs of the Hospital de Paris, and he proposed uh, a pavilion hospital layout with uh, Bernard Poirier, which basically it's, um, well, it's a, a, a building that moves along a, co a great courtyard, and with the pavilion disposed particularly to, the, to the, this central courtyard. So the first hospital to be built in France um, after the second cholera pandemic was the, this hospital, the Riboisier Hospital, which was built in between 1839 and 45 by Gautier. And this is uh, the layout from the hospital we have seen proposed by Poirier. It's basically the same thing with a big, court, a big courtyard and with the, 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 the main circulation zones around the courtyard and the building, the buildings, the pavilions, uh, disposed perpendicularly, sorry, to the central courtyard. So this typology suffered several evolutions. And in the new world, namely in the United States, when they happened the American Civil War, a commission proposed precisely to construct pavilion buildings. And they construct this, this was one of the first pavilions, the pavilion hospitals they construct, the Judiciary Square Hospital, which was a variant of the scheme we've seen so far because it has a central corridor and the pavilions are uh, uh, situated on the, both sides of this corridor. So this is, this is a variant of the scheme I've called ones the pavilion hospital in double band, PHDB, and the other ones the linear pavilion hospitals, which would be LPHH typology. 
1862, the, the American army, uh, also in the context of the Civil War, uh, built this hospital, which doesn't exist anymore. None of these hospitals exist anymore. The Satterley General's Hospital was a very large hospital uh, built in Philadelphia to receive the wounded from the Civil War. And it had uh, something like 700,000 beds. And as you can see by the limits of the land, the, they managed to build a, a, a very efficient uh, occupation of the land with a great density of occupation, and, but with the courtyard in the center. This is the Herbert Hospital. It was an hospital created of, um, to receive the wounds from the Crimean War. It was very based on the ideas of Florence Nightingale, who was a nurse, that uh, um, proposes the, to, to create these buildings with the ideal conditions of poor hair, natural light, and control temperature. They, at, this, at this point, they have understood that uh, the, the important thing to do about contagious disease was to separate the six the, one, the six with this kind of disease from the other ones, and at the same time to uh, have um, uh, um, especially a, a good ventilation between the pavilions in order to avoid the transmission of the diseases. This is a variant of the LPH typology. As you can see, uh, this kind of buildings could have uh, the, um, the pavilions situated, alternated with each other according to the corridor, or they could be aligned with one with each other. This is another uh, case of a uh, high density of land occupation. This is the St. Vincent Possible. Uh, it was constructed to receive the, the lepers in Chile, in Santiago de Chile. And um, you can see the importance of the, the, of the drawings because some of the images of the buildings are very, very, very bad. Uh, and so uh, this is also um, a building where there was an enormous density of land occupation uh, providing to, to install all the, all the six in this space. So this is the Welsh War Hospital, or the Netley Hospital, as is more known. Um, it's a variant of the LPH typology, but uh, in this case, the pavilions are not connected one with each other. They have a covered exterior circulation area that uh, links to all the buildings. And as you can see, this is the typology that has been used from th that time until now in several kinds of buildings, namely in schools, by instance, or in other kinds of buildings. Um, there are enormous kind of examples in all over the world. So uh, we can see that there's a great versatility of these buildings and pavilion complexes. Both the typologies, PhD, B, and the LPH, allows the independence of the pavilions, and they assure a very high efficiency in the density which they ensure the occupation of the ground. So this, these typologies have been used on other kind of hospitals, and I've studied the case of the universities. And the first one to use this typology on the, uh, the this tip, uh, pavilion typology was clearly Thomas Jefferson, the first president of the United States, who was also an architect. And uh, he projected this, uh, this layout, this plan for the University of Virginia in the United States it was built before, this is an interesting thing, it was built before the construction of the, of the, of the La Rivoisière Hospital in Paris, which means that uh, Jefferson also, uh, at that time, he knew already the investigations that were being done about this kind of buildings. This is the plan from Philip Johnson in 1967 for the University of St. Thomas. It is a scheme, it's rather similar to the ones we have seen so far with the double branch of buildings, with the difference that uh, the, the connecting main circul exterior circulations were two stars high and the complex was closed. So this is the plan for the University of Aveiro here in Portugal. 
And uh, this was a case where this was a plan by, by, made by a team of the University, uh, the Faculty of the University of Architecture uh, in Porto, led by Nuno Portas. And uh, this was a case where it was very, very, very important to assure a very efficient uh, uh, land occupation because the university needed to construct a lot of uh, departments for the, the several areas they had. And as you can see, they managed to build a very large, and I don't know if you know the University of Aveiro, but they have a, a very large space in the interior of the departments. And afterwards, the, the buildings are constructed very near one to the others. It's just uh, enough to have a correct light and correct ventilation between the buildings. And this is the project for the, the building of the, the Faculty of Engineering here in Oporto, uh, which is a variant of this scheme uh, adapted to the land they had, of course. But th this is an, a very big building with uh, uh, lots of students, 8,000 students and 550 teachers. And so it was precisely this scheme that allowed in the land they had to um, occupy the, the completely and install all the all the, um, the students and teachers. This is one case I thought it was interesting to show. This is the University of Odense in Denmark. It's a case when the, um, in the 60s and 70s of the last century, uh, the, um, with the, the creation of the new universities in Europe, they tried to build some kind of mega structures to uh, install all the all the universities, and this is if, if you want to see it like this, it's a variant of the scheme of the Welsh uh, hospital we've seen uh, some minutes ago, but uh, connected in a grid with a grid in order to 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 allow uh, interior circulation between all the pavilions. So. As we can see, it was the fact to need to avoid the spread of contagious disease that, uh, that, make, that led to the typology of the pavilion hospitals, which is, uh, as we can see, in fact, the circumstances generated the form, which is the title of this presentation. But we can verify that these typologies uh, are suitable for buildings of other kind of buildings with functions very different from those of hospitals. Naturally, I didn't have the time in this question, in this um, presentation, to study other kinds of uh, buildings. But uh, there's a point that's very important to um, explain, is the question of the kind of, of land occupation of some of the examples were, that we presented. In the context where they have large wars of epidemics, and when the land was uh, scarce, or not enough big, big the two typologies allowed it to, const to construct complexes with an enormous density of occupation of the soil, accommodating all the wounded and the sick. Leslie Martin and Lionel March made two studies uh, from, for soil occupation uh, in the, um, it, that are presented in the book called Urban Space and Structures. It's a book uh, that was published in 1972. Uh, by studies carried out in the Cambridge School of Architecture, which is a university where they, they have a very important component uh, of mathematics. And uh, the first study shows that um, by comparing uh, the land occupation, the, sorry, by, so in, if you have uh, isolated buildings or buildings constructed um, exploring the, the periphery of the area. They, in, in, the, in both cases, they have exactly the same area constructed. But in the first case, with buildings with nine stars high, and in the second case, with three stars high. Which means that this form of occupation of the land allows the same occupation as the other one, but less high, three, three times less high than the other one. And in this case, they compared isolated pavilions with uh, um, street pavilions and with patio pavilions, and they reached the conclusion that uh, this one has the density, the two times the density of this one, and this one three times the density of the other one. And this is very much the studies that led to the solution of the University of Aveiro. As you can see, 
in order to leave the, the grand central space in the interior uh, free from buildings, the, 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 what was precisely explored was the high density of occupation of the periphery of the, the land. And uh, it was these studies that allowed Nuno Portas to, to do this kind of, uh, of plan uh, solving the problems of the university. So this LPH typology, uh, the, the LPH typology, on the other hand, that it allows uh, also a great density of occupation of the soil, but in fact, it doesn't leave any space uh, free in the interior of the land. Both of them are uh, adequate to use in very far of, uh, of uh, very types of buildings. And as I wrote this paper for this symposium, which is on formal methods, uh, I think this is a study that is interesting precisely because possibly with some kind of uh, adequate formal methods, this, could be, this study could be systematized and try to find new applications for these typologies. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity of presenting this early stage in the early stages of my thesis, of my doctoral th thesis. Um, this began with the, in my master's and it's now being developed during the doctoral thesis in order to kind of prove how robot, uh, robotics can help us in the building processes uh, actually now, nowadays. Uh, so, first of all, as I said, it is a really uh, first stage. Uh, we started to think, what was the problem? First, uh, for us, our practice, architecture and construction mainly, still uses the manual labor. Still think we used technology, yes. We still, we can improve it and we've been improving the ways we built. Uh, but we are not using this, the robotics, as we can say, uh, as in other industries uh, that I will refer further. So, in these questions, what we want to achieve is when we want to understand if the use of robotics will uh, reduce the time of building, if it will uh, reduce costs, and mainly if it will free, uh, free the conceptual process of uh, the, think the creative process of architecture and of conceiving space. So those are the main questions that we want to prove. So as I said, uh, I wanted to see what are we are using in other industries as opposed to of of construction industry. 
As we see in many, case, in many times, the automotive construction industry is fully robotized in some of, our, of the brands. Lexus was the first one. The, we don't use manual labor in the Lexus construction. And we've used this same technique in ship, shipyards. Uh, in smaller vessels, as Bavaria, all the process is done automatically. And in the biggest ships, in the biggest vessels, the robotics has helped reducing the risk, the human risk in the building process. Uh, we can uh, cut, uh, uh, holding everything together with robotics in our days. And the, compu the, computer, the computational uh, components as well. Uh, we have fully uh, robotized industries in China, and that's the case. And we are starting to see the first um, industry, uh, shoes industry fully robotized with Nike uh, that's uh, starting to think how robotics can improve the way they conceive their products. But on the other hand, that's the first thing we want to understand is the more we advance in this part, the more value we attribute to the handmade. And we wanted to understand if that was going to happen in architecture as well. Um, so we have the case in automotive, in shipyards, and into industry. The most expensive ones are made by hand, and the most cheaper and the most common are made by robotics. So for that, we try to understand the two technologies that we could use and we can use in our building industry. First of all is a robotic arm that we are quite used to see. In many cases, we see it in factories, as I said earlier. Uh, this case is in Etegad Zurich, where the project programmed wall, the students were asked to model in 3D some walls using bricks, and then the robotic arm would build it uh, in the weirdest shapes. Uh, we have this case in uh, Cambridge, and we have also in Porto, if I hope that I forgot to put the picture. But for us, the most um, constraints that we see in robotic arms in our process or in the construction area is that it can only be built in a small area around it and in vertic uh, being around it or vertically. It has many constraints. As in the other hand, the, robotic, the drone could minimize its constraints. It had to be bigger. It has to have the capacity of loading uh, bigger parts or bigger components, if we see it as an, in factories. But the constraint of location and area is unlimited. And this is the first one, the first project that was held at ETH Zurich, the flight assembly project, where four, four drones with 1,060 robot uh, foam uh, bricks built a six-meter uh, tower in four days in Pompidou Center, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so after that, we started to talk with some of the most known pers persons on the robotic field and in architecture. We have Fabio Gramazio, Piers Bonswick, and teacher, and professor, José Pedro Sosa from FAUP. And we asked them how that, uh, this technology would enter in our practice, in the construction, uh, in the construction process. And for, both, for all three of them, they, they think that it could happen, they, we can build it, it's already possible to build with robot, robot, uh, robotics in reality, but not in the nearest, uh, the nearest years, or the future. Um, nevertheless, we now can use it, and we're not using it, in the uh, precasted and prefabricated uh, industry. And it can be the next phase and the first stage of implementing robotics in the construction sites. 
so for that, we tried, and we are now starting the first experiments in this field. We want to uh, create these three shapes. The first one, a tower with fixed bricks. That would be the, the challenge was to build with bricks this time, not with foam bricks. Uh, first of all, we, we built a tower with six bricks, then a, a vertical wall, and then a complex shape that's not shown there, wall, and how it could be built by using three, four, or five drones, and how much it would uh, take to do it. So for us, uh, we started to see that an understanding, that's how we are now starting the next stage of the investigation, that not only we can use it now, as it can bring and change the way we think about architecture and the way we conceive architecture in a, as a whole. Uh, in the end, for us, the biggest uh, challenge is to, that these technologies allow us to build wherever we want. Being underwater, as we can see in the Galp, in, in the Galp project at uh, Sao Paulo, if I'm not mistaken. And in uh, war areas, wherever we, we want, we can use them to minimize our risk in the construction industries. So, thank you. Uh, some question for the no no anyone I have a question <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> uh, if you show more or less what you are doing with drones yes but is it only in let's say a closed space or also outside no we're trying to do the first ones outside. Okay. Because in controlled environments, we've seen that we can build it with foam element in this case. But we wanted to see if the drone could lift and to upgrade the drone to lift bricks this time and to bring it outside. Okay. Yeah. To start working with the winds and all the environmental constraints and problems. Yeah, exactly. No, because faced, usually yeah. they're all inside and. Yes. Yes, one of the questions I thought was the difficulty of moving the drones. They should be uh, moved by uh, humans or by computer. or by computers. By In, computer. Yeah, uh, we were trying to make it a uh, software that could command all the drones, or you can say four or five drones, or even one drone, uh, so that our error margin could be smaller. In Etia Galzurik, we saw that uh, error margin after all the work that had to be, that had to be done in the software was 1.1 millimeter, so it's mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. it's, so we are trying to see if we can control five drums, for example, and may create complexer shapes outside, and if we can still have that margin or not. It's very interesting. <laughs> Uh, about the, the topology of the hospitals, um, do you have uh, any other kind of topology that was developed during the same time, or this was the only one that was established? No, there were and others, but I, I didn't study them. Then. There were. Um, so at the beginning, the doctors didn't knew what causes the contagious diseases. They didn't have the, the, they didn't have understood that the problem was that the, the six were all together in the same space, and so the contagious diseases could spread from one to the others. And when they, they understand it, um, they tried to build these uh, buildings in separated wings, with separated pavilions. And they tried the, the very, very sort of shapes namely the, the circular shape, by instance, or radius shapes. There are lots of uh, other kind of examples. I've always studied the ones that are um, orthogonal one to the other. And did you make any uh, kind of comparison between the, kind, the, the, the different topology and different shapes that appeared? 
Uh, sorry, I didn't did, so. did you make any comparison between like the round ones and those small orthogonal ones? Uh, I didn't to see study the, the round ones, okay. only the, the, the orthogonals. Okay. I said this, these ones I've seen, uh, I've shown today. Uh, I would like to ask to Giacomo before. Uh, firstly, um, in the beginning of the 90s, there was this hope that the digital would kill the grid. But somehow, be, instead of being a regular XY grid, it became like a morphed UV grid. Do you think that there is um, new ways of breaking with the grid? And for Nuno, I would like to ask you, what is the tracking uh, mechanism that you are using to locate the drones uh, on space? Sorry. What is the tracking mechanism that you are using the, to locate the, the, the drones in space? Yeah. Sorry, I was distracted. I, I thought, <laughs> yeah, I did. It was a question for you. If you oh, uh, okay. Uh, well, to get away of the grid. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, uh, I like the grid. So, uh, <laughs> secondly, uh, there probably are. Yes. Why? Why not? I mean, uh, the only problem is that, let's say, from a formal point of view, uh, somehow. That thing in the, that started in the 90s, now it's a kind of an, a deadlock in the sense that it's in this sort of loop of producing somehow novelties, but they are somehow always the same. Uh, there might be, yes. Pro I, I, what I, I would be interested in is that maybe going through the grid to find a way to hack it somehow uh, by using it. Of course, the result is not there yet. That's pretty clear, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, probably. Uh, I, I don't even think. Yeah, I mean, I like the squares. So. <laughs> so the, the second question was for me or uh, for no. Uh, for the tracking, we are trying to. First of all, we have to create a kind of uh, square. You can say it. Uh, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> where you can locate drones and then you have, we are trying to make with, with sensors, trying to delimitate an area, a whole area where they can build, first of all. So after we can um, uh, make it bigger and trying to uh, achieve to build in diff difficult places. For example, we are trying to make one on the top of our building in Ishkte. That was our goal. Or trying to make it, we have um, a shading system on the windows. Uh, that we wanted to try to build something in between two of those thing, uh, of those objects. And the idea was to create a kind of a smaller space with sensors, yeah, and tracking, movement, movement tracking, in order to enclose a smaller area outside, trying to create a controlled environment and uncontrolled controlled environment. Got strange <laughs> to explain. <laughs> In the beginning, we are trying to make it orchestrated, so that we can, we have a shape, and we have to decide the the, the routes they are taking, how they are movement on the space. But uh, in a, the the first that were done in Etegazvik, for example, uh, they created the an area where the drone could fly wherever he wanted. We have the, um, for example, the no-fly zone was in the center of the building. And all around the, the, the structure, the drone could go anywhere. But he had to follow always the X, Z, and, and Y of the computer. That we, are, we have a, how can I say it? Uh, in Rhino, we have the structure that we want. And it decomposes the structure in single objects. And it gives us references in our space. And the drone. They have an order, the first one will pick the first one and go to the, the second one, so it's all orchestrated. But we are trying to see if they can, if two drones could go to the same side, how they would react, or can they avoid each other? Yeah. But we are still 
trying the first ones. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, the second question is uh, certainly uh, there are some limitations to the uh, building system with drones. And uh, do you have uh, any uh, plans to document these? Uh, for example, I can imagine they can't uh, come uh, within smaller than a certain distance to an existing wall. So, uh, creating kind of constraints on the space. Or not? Uh, I'm sorry? Creating constraints on the space? Uh, exactly, and uh, those constraints uh, will probably uh, affect the design process as well. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why I'm asking mm -hmm. if uh, you will document those mm -hmm. constraints. Yes. Uh, in this case, we wanted to see, in the first time we're bringing it outside, so we have to, to constrain the movement and trying to see if it's possible or not, and how it can be built. But yes, of course, the. The, cons the spatial constraints of the, the area we're trying to build will obviously change the way we think and we create this structure. So, yeah, <laughs> I hope I asked the question. <laughs> Thank you. That, uh, sorry, that my note. That this technological leap um, can force the architecture to take precaution. Uh, I mean, um, such a, a close uh, accompaniment uh, of uh, the executive phase of the project. Uh, yes, and I don't know. Uh, yes and no, in both ways. Because mm -hmm. what I'm trying to see now is. First, the first part of my thesis, the, the master thesis, was how to build with drones. In this case, how, how can we build it? Or if they are or not able to lift heavy weights and what we have to do. Uh, but now in, uh, in the, the doctoral thesis, I'm trying to understand that not only the drone uh, and the way we think the space or architecture or, uh, to, how can I say it? To, to use something like this, we have to think, to restructure our thinking. And we have to, we are trying to create the, in the, our thesis, in my thesis, the doctoral thesis, kind of a comprehensive approach on how we can build with this. Uh, it's not, it's useless if we built it with, if we built a wall with rounds, with uh, bricks at the same time. So a human can do it. So it's less margin of error, but we can do it. But perhaps it would be, Advantages for uh, advantage for architecture. If we could think the f the beginning or the, for example, we can think about a project mm -hmm. and we can start delivering to do a factory mm -hmm. that we can control all the process and everything and uh, a line of construction of robotic arms could bring and could build everything, and then the drone could lift it <coughs> and put it on a place and start uh, or a drone or a symbiotic with a drone or a robotic arm could build whatever we want. We have to change the way we think. <laughs> yes. It's kind of strange. <laughs> OK. Uh, there are other questions? Um, yes. Any questions for Kuma? Um, uh, you met us. <laughs> just explain, would not uh, be some sort of uh, alternative to parametric design? I've never thought yeah. about that. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I mean, the, I don't see it as a parametric method, but yes, there is a mathematics that was mentioned in 3D something. I mean, just a notation. Uh, Yeah, it could, maybe. It could be developed in that sense. I mean, the thing is that that one was really the beginning of what I've been, been doing the last year and six months. Now it's has been taken, I mean, it has taken a different direction in the sense that I'm using, kind of, let's say, 3D reconstructions to pictures towards something different. But 
you say so, I have to rethink it. In the end of the, the, the paper, you state that uh, architecture cannot be reduced uh, to a method. Okay. Yeah, I have to apologize. And, and, and I get taken by adrenaline when I talk, and I say. <laughs> <laughs> But um, and uh, the, the way of representing architecture to form is the project. Okay. Uh, so, um, is uh, or what should be the, the project's rule in your approach? Well, uh, then it's yes. The thing is, I don't know. In the sense that should there really be a rule? In the sense that uh, in this all, in this overall discussion about methods, uh, I came across. This Austrian philosopher Thayer Eben, Thayer Eben, uh, who wrote this book against method, which I think is really interesting nowadays also because at first he criticized the idea that, let's say, human disciplines are taking too many protocols by sciences. So we are somehow developing certain, certain kinds of research programs in order to have funding, but somehow, sometimes, a bit losing the point of what we are doing. Uh, and on the other hand, is architecture, architecture just a method? In the sense like uh, also in the 18th century, I think Piranesi is really right in that sense uh, when he argues that probably we shouldn't reduce architecture to just a thing. So I don't know. Uh, it's an open question, but I wouldn't take it as a enclosing rule. That's why parametric <laughs> things can be. No more questions? No. So, finish? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your time.